Cells are the foundational unit of living organisms, yet embody incredible complexities at the molecular level. To zoom in on the microscopic machinations of life, scientists use specific detection methods to separate the signal from the noise. Hello, I'm Jack Wang, a microbiologist and science educator based in Australia. Today, we will build on our previous videos on light microscopy and talk about more sensitive staining and fluorescence labeling techniques. Living cells that have not been stained with any kind of dye can still be seen down the microscope. We can prepare a wet mount and swab some cells onto liquid media on a glass slide. We can focus on these living cells by adjusting the coarse and fine focus dials on the light microscope. Unless you have a phase contrast microscope though, it can be difficult to see the edges of the cells. They are after all unstained and translucent at this point. If we heat fix them, we can add a stain that greatly increases the cell's visibility and contrast. We have a separate video all about gram staining linked in the description below. Immunofluorescence or IF experiments involve labeling cells with specific antibodies so that any fluorescence signal is only coming from one type of protein or molecule. We can grow cells on glass cover slips, which are submerged in liquid nutrient media in plates stored within an incubator. We covered how to set these experiments up in our three-part series on cell and tissue culture, all of which are linked below. We first remove the media from the wells and do three washes with PBS. Remember to be gentle when drawing up or pipetting liquid. Try and do so at an angle down the side of the well rather than directly onto the cover slip. The next step is to fix the cells and freeze their activity at a specific moment in time. We can do this with a range of different fixative solutions, but in this case, we're using 4% paraformaldehyde or PFA. The cells are left fixing a PFA at room temperature for up to 30 minutes. Wash off the PFA by doing three washes with PBS again. The next step is to permeabilize the cell membrane using detergents, in this case, 0.5% Triton X100. This step can be considered optional if what you're labeling is on the surface of the cell membrane, but really the majority of immunolabeling targets proteins inside the cell. This permeabilization step will allow the antibodies you add onto the cover slips to penetrate the cell and bind to the right molecules with high affinity. This can take anywhere from five to 20 minutes at room temperature before washing the detergent off with PBS three times. The final step before we add antibodies is to add blocking solution onto the cells. This prevents any non-specific binding between antibodies and non-target structures as the blocking solution is flooded with other proteins. You can make this blocking solution up with 1% bovine serum albumin, BSA or serum. From this step onwards, we'll be adding antibodies so everything is diluted and washed with blocking solution to minimize non-specific binding at each step. Leave the blocking solution on the cells at room temperature for 30 to 60 minutes. Now we're ready to add immunolabels to the cells. We now need to add a primary antibody diluted and blocking solution on the cells. Doing this in the 24 well plates requires a lot more volume of antibody to cover the entire surface of the cover slip. If you do not have much of the antibody, you can conduct a whole experiment on parafilm instead. The antibody solution will form droplets on the surface of the parafilm and you can flip the cover slip onto the antibody solution. This will use a much lower volume overall to accomplish the same end result. Antibodies are created by using the target protein from one organism, for example, protein A from human cells, as an antigen in a different organism, mice, rabbit, and rats are all very common. You'll often see primary antibodies labeled as mouse anti-human, rabbit anti-human, or rat anti-human as a result. We dilute the antibody in blocking solution and incubate at room temperature for up to two hours or overnight at four degrees Celsius, often on a spinning wheel. If you're doing a direct immunofluorescence experiment, the antibody already has a fluorescence marker attached, so you should incubate the sample in the dark to avoid photo bleaching of the fluorophore. If it is an indirect IF experiment, then you don't have to worry about this until the next step. Wash off the primary antibody with blocking solution three times, and now add the secondary antibody. The secondary antibody is designed to bind the primary antibody, not the original target protein. We're working with human cells in this example, and the primary antibody was rabbit anti-human. The secondary antibody needs to be raised in another organism, not human or rabbit in this example, against the primary antibody. In this case, goat 
anti-rabbit. Given that the only rabbit protein on the human cells is the primary antibody we just added, this ensures a specific binding between the primary and secondary antibodies. The secondary antibody is conjugated through a fluorescent label, so we need to perform all the remaining steps in a light-sensitive manner. We leave the secondary antibody on for 60 minutes at room temperature before washing off with blocking solution three times. Fluorescent tags have different wavelengths of light for excitation and emission. In this case, we have green fluorescent protein or GFP, which has excitation emission peaks of 490 and 525 nanometers respectively. We can shine a 490 nanometer laser at the sample and the resulting fluorescent signal emitted will occur around 525 nanometers. Your microscope will need a filter that can capture emissions around this wavelength and interpret it as fluorescent signal. There are different fluorescent tags with varying excitation emission peaks. Staining the nuclei is very common in these experiments and we can do so with DAPI, a blue dye that is around 352 nanometer excitation and 455 nanometer emission. You can see that there is a distinct gap between each of these excitation emission peaks for GFP and DAPI. This is by design and avoids interference or bleed through between different fluorescence channels. If we wanted to add a third immunolabel to this experiment, red fluorescence signals are often around 556 excitation and 573 nanometer emission, which sits neatly between the blue and green wavelengths without much overlap. We can stain the same sample with different colored fluorescent tags and visualize multiple molecular markers at the same time. We add the DAPI stain. Leave it on for 10 minutes at room temperature. They perform four washes, this time with PDS and not blocking solution. All that's left is to mount it to a glass slide. Add a drop of mounting media and invert the side of the cover slips with cells on onto it. Let the sample dry before sealing the edges with nail polish and we are now ready to image the samples. Turn on the fluorescent lamp connected to your microscope. It may take a few minutes to warm up properly. Load the slide onto the microscope and use a combination of the coarse and fine focus dials to move your cells into the correct field of view. Depending on what filters your microscope has installed, you can cycle through the different filters to look at the fluorescent signal emitted across different wavelengths. In our example, we're looking at nuclear staining in the blue channel with DAPI and actin staining in the green channel with GFP. We can overlay the images on top of each other and you can see the difference in the bright field unstained channel the actin channel in green, and the nuclei channel in blue, all in the same cells. This gives scientists a powerful tool of examining how different molecules are working together in different locations throughout the same cell. The main limitation for this technique is cost. Good monoclonal antibodies against your protein of interest can be very expensive, as are the microscopes that can detect the fluorescence signal across different channels. Hopefully you'll be able to play with all of these reagents and equipment as you gain more laboratory experience in your career. This is the BioLab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne, and I'll see you in the next video.